Well, good morning. We we're gonna sit outside this morning, enjoy the sun, and uh, we're uh, yeah we're here, and uh, we're gonna continue on in chapter three of the storm tossed family. Let me just pull it back a little bit to where we left off. We're talking about the family being spiritual warfare. Let me just catch this up in Russell Moore's book. He says, this warfare is not just cosmic or social, but decidedly personal. In the Proverbs, a father warns his son that ad adultery could appear to just happen when in reality a strategically conceived plot, the coaxing of a hunted prey into a slaughterhouse. That's Proverbs 5 and 7. Perhaps you've noticed this in your own life. Just when it seems that your family situation is what you would like or what God would like for you, something unhinges. It would be as easy to blame this on external pressures or temptations around us we can say that technology is too difficult to navigate or that the culture is too sexualized or that people just don't respect the family like they used to. The Bible allows no such a nostalgia or however, showing us the perils to the family and every generation outward from Eden. We have different points of vulnerability, not just in our internal lives, but also in our families. For some, the pull is to abandonment. For others, the pull is to infidelity. To others still, the pull is to selfishness or negligence. There are powers at work who know your vulnerabilities and those around you. You cannot fight such battles with your intelligence or your willpower. Such spiritual warfare must be met at every point with the gospel. The gospel informs our place in the family because the gospel redefines two points at which the devil rages the most. Our identity and our inheritance. When Jesus taught us to pray, the, the first words on his tongue were our Father. That is, before anything else, a statement about who we are. Jesus is the Son of the Father, language that situates him in his eternal relationship to God. John 5, 18 to 23 but also situates him as the true Israel of God, God's firstborn son, and as the heir of the throne of David. Like most evangelical Christians, I conclude most of my prayers in the words, in Jesus' name. And Jesus told us, if you ask me anything in my name, I'll do it. In my younger days, I took this to mean that those words were especially to get God's attention. So I would pepper them all around requests with where there's no particular importance to me, but in Jesus' name, please let me pass my algebra. In Jesus' name, and in Jesus' name, and in Jesus' name. That's not what Jesus was telling us to do, and is in fact, it's quite the opposite. Before teaching his disciples to pray, he taught them how not to pray. He taught us not to use prayer as a way of public display, to seem pious to those around him. But public display is only just one of his concerns. He also said that we shouldn't pray, quote, heap up empty phrases like the Gentiles do, for they th think that they will be heard for their many words. That's Matthew 6, 7. That was certainly true 
of virtually every other people on the earth who taught of their gods as or they thought as their gods were these distant impersonal figures who at best regarded human beings as their servants with gods like that a people would need to learn how to find ways to gain an audience think of the priests of baal cutting themselves and screaming into the sky but there was no voice no one answered no one paid, att paid attention that's the mount carmel at first kings 18. the prophet elijah on the other hand merely prayed and fire fell of those who feel the need to manipulate their God with their constructed phrases or magical incantations. Jesus said this, do not be like them for your father knows what you need before you ask him. There are two crucial parts of this statement, your father and what you need, identity and inheritance. Our family backgrounds are, are meant to tell us something about who we are, and more importantly, who we are not. We aren't self-creating, self-sustaining gods. We are part of someone else's story. Backward into the past and perhaps forward into the future, you and I are each the product of a near infinite series of decisions that other people made. If your great, great grandfather had not emigrated to this homeland, you might not be able to read the language on this page. If my grandmother had not decided to disregard her parents' wishes and elope as a teenager with that older man, I would not exist. I would not want anyone else to repeat her decision and can only imagine my dismay if one of my own children were to do likewise. But nonetheless, I am glad I exist. A sense of identity is marked out in many ways, starting with our names. Think of how much of the Bible is taken up with genealogies. I once was horrified to hear a preacher read through a text of scripture and skipping over the list of bagats with words yada 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 before starting up with the narrative. Setting aside this man's thoughtless handling of the word of God, one can understand something of why the preacher did not want to get bogged down in a series of names as the father of dot 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 and the son of dot dot dot. It doesn't seem relevant, but it is. Note how often the Bible refers to figures as Joshua, son of Nun, or Saul, son of Kish, or John, the son of Zebedee. Even in our individualistic cultural moments, we haven't quite transcended to this. You probably don't know anything about my relatives, but if you know me, you are confronted immediately with at least something about them when you learn my name, Moore. Tells you who my father fam or my fa father's family is, and if one wanted, tells a story that could be traced back to, I'm told, the Moors of England. Even if that proved not to be where my name came from, the family lore of it would still tell you something about us. That we're the kind of people that would like to be from the Moors of England. I suppose if I wanted, I could seek to individuate myself by rejecting my family's name and just be Russell. That too, though, would point back to my family. The fact that my name is Russell and not Sergei or Moon Unit is because my parents were neither Russians or hippies. In fact, even if I were to rename myself, the people around me would still have tied my name to my family. That, that Ozymandias or Gary and Renee's little boy, something's wrong with him, 
far deeper than the relative superficiality of our names is the way that we learn who we are very early on from our interactions with our families. Psychologists tell us how our personalities can be shaped lifelong by the ways our parents mirrored back to us who we were as individuals and as those who belong in the larger family structure. Identity is rooted in family. I think it's interesting about how we hear about the pastor uh, skipping over those genealogies as, uh, as if they really were uh, white noise or just static that was in the Bible. And I, I love what Russell um, does as he kind of uh, challenges that. And I, and, I, and I do love that. Like Joshua, son of, uh, you know, John, son of Zebedee. We don't say that. I don't. I'm not. I don't introduce myself and say I'm John, son of Michael and Hymer Thwaites. Um, but what I love what it does is it shows immediately your identity of who you who you came from. And the other thing about names is so powerful. You know, Michaela um, is putting the hopes. So I think it means putting the hopes in the in the power of God. And Sydney, well, Sydney was uh, her middle name, and Sydney was more connected to the place, Sydney, Australia, because that's where God really did a powerful move in Crystal's life. So with Cyprus, uh, it was an interesting thing is um, we named Cyprus after the tree, not the country, Cyprus. And uh, my Nana at the time, she was in her mid 90s, and she called um, after he was born. And, and, uh, and she said, well, why would you John, uh, name your son after the tree of death. And I was like, oh, and I'm on the phone. I'm like, well, I, 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 what? And she's like, and so my Nana began to continue. And she's like, when you go to places like Cyprus and into the Mediterranean, when you go to the graveyards and the grave where all the gravestones are, that's the plant that they, that's the tree that they use in the, in all these grave, <laughs> graveyard plots is, is Cypress trees. And I just in that moment was like, I, I didn't know. So to my Nana, to her perspective, it's like, you just named your son after the tree of death. In that moment, God just dropped something down. Before Cyprus was born, we had two miscarriages. And that was really hard for us as a family. Uh, really hard on Crystal. So I said to my Nana, I said, well, I think his name will always memorialize the children that we lost. She didn't know. She didn't, and I didn't make it want to say it to hurt her feelings. But she on the phone was like, "Well, that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it?" Even just the little things like that. There's every time I think of Cyprus, I think about his name. I'll always remember of the two kids that we lost before he was born. See, you all have very specific names for a reason. Maybe they're tied to your family. Maybe it's not tied to your family and your family was like, I want something completely different to break free from some other kind of generational thing. In some cultures, names have huge meaning, like to be named after your grandfather. I know for me, I was named after my grandfather, John. In some families, it's it's almost cultural to to have a Maria or a, to, to have a Gino or to have a a John or a Mark or a Luke or a Matthew. But to know that you're not generic, to know that you're not just X, you have a name and more importantly, God knows your name. I'm reminded of that text, I think it's in Matthew where God says that he also numbers the hairs on your head. He knows your name he knows how many hair, or what in my case, lack of hair that he you have on your head. He knows you full well. And just like what Russell Moore was talking about with the, you know, first Kings, like the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal, the reason why those priests were yelling and screaming, yelling and screaming the name of their God is they're trying to, to get his attention. Look, you don't have to do that. He has your attention. He had your attention before you got up this morning. So go to him in whatever finite and fallenness that you've had, whatever sin that you have, 
and go to him and ask for repentance and say, God, I know you know my name. I know you got my, you got my heart. Restore me. Recover me. And recover my family. And God will hear the cry of your heart. And I, and I love what Russell Moore talks about with prayer, how not to pray. You don't have to make this flamboyant kind of, you know, use the these and the thous and the father gods and all that kind of stuff. Just pray what is on the cry of your heart, what's on your heart. And God knows. God knows the, the heart before you even utter a single word. Well, God bless you this morning. Uh, just enjoy this beautiful day. That's why I'm out here having my cup of coffee, um, praying for you. Got some good news about level two, so we'll be talking about that and how that uh, shakes out for us for next week. But God bless you, and we will see you tonight at 8 o'clock. Bye for now.